Patrick, you can give me a little music or we do you want me to just start? Oh, there we go. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the last first Friday presentation of 2022. Uh, we're getting in the holiday spirit and that means food. So, Carolyn Schenkel, our special collection specialist, and Patrick Dollar, archivist extraordinaire, are going to talk about vintage holiday recipes and cookbooks here in Special Collections and University Archives. Um, anyone here is welcome to ask questions in the chat or make recipes for me since I don't really cook, but I like to eat. So anyway, uh, welcome and uh, please take it away. All right, give me just one second to get our presentation up on a screen. Havana, I feel like you're the only one who has on any holiday colors. I know that's that's pretty ironic. Okay. And everybody can see that? Excellent. Excellent. Some reason sometimes when I have double screens, this gets a little confusing for me. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, joining Patrick and myself. We've got a great presentation set up for you, stirring the pot, holiday recipes from special collections and university archives. So here at University Libraries, we have a long history of cooking um, and holiday recipes. Patrick was an archivist extraordinaire and found this little clipping in the Carolinian back in November of 1979 that tells everyone that there is a second cookbook from the library. Um, and initially our cookbooks were called Columns Cookery. And I love this, like the first cookbook, this one contains tried and true recipes from the files of the many good cooks on the library staff. So we've had a long history of having good cooks. And so we started off with those two cookbooks. In 1995, there was an exceptional potluck holiday luncheon. Um, and this Christmas Recipes 1995 cookbook came out of that. But most recently, Patrick Dollar headed up a very special cookbook, the University Library's Holiday Recipes Cookbook in 2020. We're going to do a little flashback to our first library's cookbook, published in 1976, um, has this great orange cover on it. Our first special collections special um, special collections librarian Emmy Mills actually did the artwork that you see here on the cover, and this is a, this cookbook's chock block full of great recipes. It has been digitized, and one of these recipes I'm featuring in here is the one for eggnog. And Sarah Hudson, who was a staff member at the library at the time, she shared this recipe in this cookbook. But she is also known. Um, as her husband was in the MFA program studying sculpture, and he's the one who sculpted the head that we always see downstairs on the main level of the library. And Sarah is known for having made that hat and the beard. I think it's been refurbished since the, she first made it on 76 or 77, but that hat and beard are the, what she crafted, decorated. You know if these were made in the library for librarians? These recipes? Yeah, yeah I, it's my understanding that in the 70s and the 80s, there were a lot of, um, for staff functions, all the staff would make the food, or there was a lot of staff gatherings at houses. There's been some stories that have wafted down to me of some great parties that happened on um, in the College Hill neighborhood. Wow. That might be a, a separate first Friday. So now we're, <laughs> to my understanding, we're just down to your rum cake and everything else is <clears throat> is alcohol substance free. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, but Sarah's got the good eggnog recipe right here. So three years later, um, there seemed to still, you know, be this interest in making another cookbook, and so they came out with the second 
issue of Columns Cookery. And this just, this is why I love to read cookbooks, especially thinking about Thanksgiving and all the pie making that we all may have just finished enjoying. Um, I love to read cookbooks because you see so many variants on the same recipe. We have two versions of Million Dollar Pie. The first one, they're featuring peaches and pineapple. The second one, they've just got pineapple. But then if you go down to the Millionaire's Pie, they've, they're back to the peaches and the pineapples again. So everyone has their own version of their pie and I'm sure each one tastes the best. Any idea why it was called Millionaire's Pie? Because I would have thought they could do better than I, canned. I don't know. Food. I've not been down that rabbit hole yet. Okay. That well, is a future rabbit hole. Okay, excellent. But now we've got come on to the most recent University Libraries cookbook. Yeah, so we put the social committee, um, rather than the staff association, which is who put out the columns cookery, um, the social committee put out the 2020 cookbook. Um, it was obviously during pandemic year, so we all thought it would be a cheerful way to remember all the great food that we would typically have um, here in the library. Um, people normally bring um, potluck, their own desserts, here for our annual holiday luncheon. And so we solicited folks to submit their favorite holiday recipes that everyone could cook at home and sort of enjoy um, being connected to their colleagues that way. So one of the recipes that I wanted to highlight was this Nantucket cranberry pie, which Christine Fisher um, submitted, but um, it originally came from Gaylor Callahan in the 1995 cookbook that Carolyn mentioned. So it was sort of resurrected again and repeated for our 2020 cookbook. So that tells you that it's a really good recipe. Um, and then I picked out Stacy Krim, uh, submitted her great grandmother's latkes. So again, pulling in all those family traditions and the family legacy. Um, she also submitted some really great, I'm going to, I'm going to say it, metadata about the uh, recipe. So giving you some great historical background about latkes and Hanukkah, which I thought was, was cool. Way cool. So in addition to the library, other entities here on campus have created um, recipe books over the years. So we have a couple coming from Elliott Hall, which is now called the Elliott University Center um, at UC. And this one is from 1956. And it was called Let's Have a Party. And according to the inside of the, the booklet, it's just a small little booklet. It was compiled at the request of several counselors and social chairmen. It's being offered on an experimental basis with the hope that you will offer your suggestions and criticisms for improvement. And all the recipes are designed to serve 50 people unless they're otherwise noted um, in the recipe. So it was really meant for sort of an entertaining cookbook um, because the Elliott Hall is used to providing um, re recipes and food for large functions. So most of their recipes are geared towards these larger functions. And I pulled out two that seemed pretty holiday, um, wintry related. So hot cocoa, do not boil that milk. Do not boil it, that will ruin it. Um, the cocoa recipe and also a cider punch. And the cider punch you will notice does not have alcohol in it. Um, it sounds really tasty, but all again, all large quantities. So if you're gonna do these at home, you're probably gonna wanna do some math, some recipe math and divide these in at least two, maybe three. And I think that this was probably the first one. Um, and then time for refreshments was a second one because in the inside cover of this one, which also came out in 1956, it doesn't say that this is another experimental cookbook. So I think they released the first one and got feedback and then released the time for refreshments, which has a lot more um, of the same recipes. They're pretty much the same thing repeated again. Um, but I pulled out on this one, um cranberry punch which i've never heard of it sounds pretty good as well 
And according to the blurb, they say that we hope that they will prove equally refreshing for the times when alumni gather. So these are, again, meant for entertaining, hopefully meant to entertain alums uh, um, as they get together outside of the university in groups of 50 or more, I guess, which that sounds crazy to me, but okay. The Elliott Hall was, was just a central gathering space at that right. time, yeah. Um, the Carolyn, next... I'm sorry, Carolyn reminded me that uh, there are links to um, the digitized ones, so I'm going to put them all in the chat right now. So uh, please copy and paste. Thank you. So there's also an Omicron new cookbook, which, oh my gosh, Sean, if you would chime in and remind everyone what collection this came out of. Um, I don't remember their current name, um, but at the time in 1978, it came from the School of Home Economics. Um, Omicron New was chartered at UNCG on May 30th, 1942. It's um, not a sorority per se, it's an honor society that recognizes outstanding students in the field of home economics. Um, so unlike um, the library's cookbook, which was really cheap, um, this one cost $7 plus $1 shipping and handling. And um, this was not the first cookbook um, to come out of the School of Home Economics. So previously, uh, the Home Economics Club compiled and sold at least four different cookbooks between 1920 and 1940. So a pretty big output in 20 year time span. And they were meant to secure funds to aid the students. And I pulled out, um, I was really searching for something that explicitly tied itself to the Christmas holiday, just because I'm curious. Um, and this one popped out at me because it says bake for three hours and 15 minutes at 250 degrees, which is pretty crazy for a cake. I'm assuming it's more like a fruit cake. It does have candied cherries in it. Um, not a lot of the other um, candy fruits, but I'm assuming that this is a lot like a fruit cake. So we've got the cookbooks from the University um, Archives collection, but we also have a very large collection of North Carolina, specifically North Carolina cookbooks. Um, this collection, we're in the process of having it cataloged and making it available online. We do have copyright restrictions for what can be digitized. And by the time this collection is fully cataloged, we're going to have close to 2,000 unique items in it. So pretty exciting to have all that. Um, and we cover from Murphy to Manio. We go from one end from the state to the other. We're still actively collecting. We're always looking for um, communities and civic groups that might be underrepresented. So we're always keeping an idea and an eye out for, for what might be there. And here you just see a smattering of what we cover. We've got one from High Point that is from their Greek Orthodox Church. We've got one that was a radio program called, called Tell Your Neighbor, and they've compiled all the recipes that were shared on that radio program. And then this is my all-time favorite cookbook title, When the Restaurants Are Closed and the Cater Can't Come. And that was right here in Greensboro with Temple Emanuel Sisterhood. So great titles. Foodie people, they're just funny. They're great. What, yeah. what makes them funny? I don't know. I don't know, but people who cook with food, they've just got a great sense of humor. I don't know if it's because um, when you're cooking, things happen, and sometimes unexpected things happen. And I always keep what Julia Child said in mind that if you're fixing a dish and it doesn't come out quite the way you expected, rename it. <laughs> if, you, if it was something that you thought was gonna result in a pudding, but mm, it didn't quite solidify, call it a sauce just go with the flow. Okay, and you had, we had spoken earlier and you had said that pretty much every church. Oh yes. Religious, you know, uh, entity most put the, out a cookbook. I've noticed that at least in the Protestant denominations, I have not done a full deep down search and everything, but a lot of the Protestant denominations will have their own version of punch. So you'll have Presbyterian punch, you'll have Baptist punch, you'll have Methodist punch. 
Um, but what's unique about the Episcopal churches is that recipe will include liquor. <laughs> Most of the other churches, they don't include the liquor in that recipe. But we're gonna go feature one of our cookbooks in particular. Which Carolyn was kind enough to humor me and <gasps> let me put in the cookbook that um, I donated from my county, which is Ash County, North Carolina. I gave you a little image. It's up in the tippy top corner, up at the left, right of the Tennessee, Virginia line. Ash County, my town is West Jefferson. Um, this is actually from the church that I grew up in, um, West Jefferson, First Baptist Church. My mom was on the cookbook committee um, to put it together. So she wrote me into submitting a lot of the recipes in the cookbook and she submitted a lot as well. Um, and the, now were the these fun I, were these fundraisers for the church or just? You know, I should remember that. I don't remember what it was raising funds for. I think it was, actually I do. I think it was raising funds to put in an elevator at the church, which um, it's a big church. It's like three stories tall. So, you know, those little old ladies can't go up those stairs. And did, were these sold uh, in locally or, you know, were they hawking them in the on the side of the road or pretty much just people in the church? I think it was pretty much them. people in the church and then they distributed them to people in the town. So I, I, I know that a lot of people bought multiple copies and then gave them to friends. And I have I have multiple copies, which is why I gave one to special collections. <laughs> which okay. we deeply, deeply appreciate. Thanks, Patrick. So I picked um, a, a recipe that my mom makes every uh, Christmas. My mom is Jennifer down below who submitted this recipe, which is my grandma's uh, gingerbread recipe. Um, it's really good. It's like a, it's like cakey gingerbread. It's not like a gingerbread cookie. Um, but it's pretty basic. It's pretty easy. Um, but it'll, it'll get you that uh, holiday taste. I like that it includes buttermilk. No, not milk, but buttermilk, because then you get that nice tang to it mm -hmm. as well. But Christmas and Thanksgiving aren't the only holidays that we celebrate with food. So we're going to jump way back in time. We're going to jump back to 1889, and we're going to look at this cookbook called Aunt Babette's Cookbook. Now we have this one in our collection. It's in our woman's collection. Um, so it's a little bit curious. If you look at the title page, it says cookbook foreign and domestic receipts instead of recipes. That's what, what people would have said for the household. Um, and if careful viewers will notice that there's a Star of David on the title page. And that's your first clue for the purpose of this cookbook. Um, Aunt Babette, her real name was, as you can see on the title page, Bertha Kramer. She was involved with the um, Reform Judaism here in the United States. And she's specifically involved with the German Reform um, Judaism that had, so these were individuals who, and families who had immigrated to the United States in the earlier part of the 19th century. So by the 1880s, they are very well established in communities across the, across the whole United States. But this cookbook is, was interesting in that it was not overtly Jewish. She doesn't actually say anything directly about it being a Jewish cookbook. Um, a lot of the recipes, again, they're going to come from the dramatic tradition, specifically the, the areas around Vienna. And you kind of have to be, you have to do some deducing for what she's really doing here. So this type of cake, and she's got the old German um, spelling for it, is called a Google hump. I love that name. We today would think of it more like a bunt cake. You would, because we're accustomed to seeing those bunt cake forms, but this is a very specific type of cake. And in her uh, recipes, this is a little hard to translate because she is giving you measurements and for how much something would cost. So she's, when she says, soak two cents worth of compressed yeast, 
I haven't quite done the math to volume translation from 1889 to what it would be in 2022. Um, so there's some, there's some challenges here for trying to recreate her recipes, but this type of cake would have been something that could have been used uh, when you break fast on Yom Kippur. Um, this was something that was traditional again in Vienna that the Jewish housewives would have created on that day. So it's got an interesting place in our history for the immigration experience into the United States. Um, this was not the first cookbook for Jewish cookery. That goes to Esther Levy, who had her Jewish cookery book that was published in 1871. But this cookbook was the one that was reprinted the most. So it's the one that most people are familiar with. It's something that was sort of geared not only towards those of Jewish heritage, but again, anybody could come to use this cookbook. Um, what's interesting about it is that she doesn't mention any holidays directly, except she has a chapter listed as Easter dishes. And for those of the Jewish faith, that's Passover. So this to me is, is interesting because in here, she describes how you're supposed to set the Seder table and lists out where everything should go. She starts to, and then she goes into uh, the types of foods that would be served. Um, it's also the only time you see anything in Hebrew in this book. And it's on that first page, lower portion, and it's referring to um, one of the foods that's traditional to have. So, Again, this is just kind of speaks to that immigration experience. Towards the latter part of the 19th century, you start to have the Jewish population from Eastern Europe coming in. This may have been a way to introduce them into the customs that were in play already in the United States. We're not quite sure who, her, who all of her intended audience was with this. Um, but we, do we know, know that. Do we know anything about Aunt Babette? She was just close, she and her family were closely affiliated with the reform movement, reform Judaism movement. That's why you're going to start to see recipes in here where they mix milk and meat in the dishes. Um, you're Ooh. going to start to see some shellfish recipes in here. So they were not part of the conservative movement or the orthodox movement that was happening in the latter part of the 19th century. Okay, and that is uh, digitized in the, in the yes. chat, I put the link. So yes. If anyone wants to, wants to look at that one, yeah. Make Googlehof or matzo pudding, matzo pudding. There you go. Yeah. Matzo but now we're gonna we're gonna jump forward for in time, and we're gonna talk about Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we have a very vibrant Jewish community here in Greensboro, and actually, we started to have some of our first permanent Jewish communities settle here in the Greensboro area in about the 1890s. Um, Temple Emanuel, whose cookbook I'm featuring here, um, their community really can trace them, themselves back to about, about 1907. So this is the favorite, this is my most favorite cookbook title ever. And um, going back to Aunt Babette, but bringing it forward, here are some of the Passover recipes that they have in their cookbook. And these are a little easier for our modern eye to read as far as measurements and what all the ingredients that you need to put in there. Um, and I do love the fact that they're telling you to place the nuts in a plastic bag before crushing them with a rolling pin to avoid messy cleanups. As a cook, I need to know that. I need to know all those good details. And then for the holiday of Purim, they, there's a special type of cookie that is made. And so they've got their recipe for that. And then for Hanukkah, they've got their special Hanukkah cookie, re cookie recipes also available. So yeah, these are all, these are all really good, good recipes. And I love how detailed they are and specific with how you're supposed to use things like do not use the mix master. <laughs> what any idea why I, I know not I things. think I'm gonna go out on a limb here Patrick please correct me I think it's because a mix master would would aerate the dough too much would make it too stiff um 
So obviously somebody has used a mix master and has had a fail with this recipe. And now they're letting us learn from that mistake. And as a cook, I appreciate all the help I can get. <laughs> all right, sisterhood. All right. So these are great recipes. Anybody getting excited to go cooking? I'm excited to go eating. All right, does it, um, are any, I guess, questions now? Please put them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to start because that's how I do. Uh, oh, Shelby. So you guys can try anything. Oh, look at that. So people can bring in and Shelby and I could uh, be on the tasting committee. We could have a new new in-house library committee. Um, are there any specific recipes that during the research to put this together or just general perusing recipe uh, or cookbooks that jumped out at you, but either, either or, either both and of uh, like, oh my gosh, I want to make that, or oh, who would eat that? Like things with tongue and aspect, which are, always horrify <laughs> me. That's just me though. I don't want to eat tongue and aspect. I'm a sucker for funny recipe titles. So in the Omicron new cookbook, there was one for, it was like a potato salad. Uh, layered potato salad, but it was called Tater Stuff. And I was like, that's a that's a great title. And there was a gorilla casserole, which was just beef. I don't really know why it was called gorilla, but um, I'm a sucker for those type of recipes that have a an intriguing title. Gor gorilla with a O or gorilla with a U-E? Uh, with an O. Oh, wow. I, I, they both have, okay, that's all right. Good to know. Or you know. So um, I see MK ask about the year for the Temple Emanuel Sisterhood. This one actually, this is this one comes out of my personal collection. Um, I'm trying to find another copy to donate. And I am looking for their year that they <laughs> did this. So many calf heads. One even one is too many in my in my humble opinion. doesn't say right away. Well, I'll have to do some digging to find out when this one was printed. And do we have uh, Christine's cookbook from Anne's Church? Do we have a copy of that? I don't know. I'll need to look. I would need to know her church. Oh, Howard Coble. Brains and eggs. All right. Well, it's just my prejudice is showing. I also don't like any organ meats. So yeah, Kelly, you've you've brought up a great thing. It's that like the modern cookbooks they give you an idea of how to make the recipe, and then when you go back and look at some of those older ones, they assume you know how to do it. So yeah, there's a recipe that's one of my favorites that just says prepare the brains. That's it. That that's all you get for your instructions. <laughs> I've been forced just to, for relationship issues to cook occasionally. And now it's like all recipes tell you the the store, like, you know, stories. I'm like, can we just get to the recipe, personal stories? So um, that's, you know, I'm sure there's some scholar that has done work on the history of, you know, the metamorphosis of cookbooks. I'm looking forward to just it going back to the recipes because I don't really care what Mary or, you know, Pete have to say about their feelings and thoughts of, and experiences. Just give me the dang recipe. Okay, like the end of the British Bake Off. I watched that. Anyway, kill a lot of squirrels. <laughs> hey, okay, so British Bake Off and Squirrel Brains is the, are the, maybe the last, is that what we're really going to leave this with? Come on, somebody else. I, I really want that gingerbread thing i love gingerbread i will make it literally next week nice will you okay. bring it in that's the yes. question oh yeah i'm not gonna keep <laughs> it at home okay all right well uh if no one else has anything um happy well, december patrick, patrick you, and no. I, you and i might have something oh that's um, right that's right so who here in our audience remembers from our all personnel meeting about the secret password. 
or rum cake? For the rum cake. All right, Patrick, should we say it at the same time? I, you say it, Carolyn. Okay. So the secret password is Gladys for the rum cake. So what does that mean? We have the word Gladys and well, we knock on your door or, or a, get a slice or a swig, a swig of cake? <laughs> yes, Scott would know. Um, well, the name Gladys because the recipe I use is my grandmother's recipe and her name was Gladys. So that's Miss Gladys's cake. So evidently we're, there's going to be secret desserts throughout the library. <laughs> like hidden? That's could go. I'm not quite sure so how poorly. this is gonna play out. Okay. If we could not put in any like the archives. speakeasy, yes. <laughs> okay, speakeasy cake, all right. Hey, all right, we? well, that's, that's something to look forward to. That's what, December 15th? I should remember. Yeah, I think that's the ukulele concert. So it is December fifteenth at eleven thirty. So mark your calendars, y'all. And okay. this would be the rum cake would be a great cake for speakeasy cake. Indeed. All right. So Gladys, I think even I for rum cake will remember that. <laughs> um, so I guess how are we gonna are we gonna find out more about the holiday dessert scavenger hunt? I guess that's information that'll be shared out later. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we've worked out the exact details. Okay. All right. Well, this is exciting. Uh, special passwords and okay. Excellent. All right. I'm going to start carrying a notebook around. Well, thank you both. And thank you everyone who uh, listened in and chimed in. And uh, bon appetit. Isn't that what Julie Child is? <laughs> Okay, thank you. See you next year. <laughs>